Um, also, thanks very much for the, uh, for the kind invitation to speak here today. And um, I don't know whether it was completely previsioned, but I think, at least I hope my story matches quite nicely, follows up on, on the points that Anneli made as well. Um, indeed, I, am a cons I study EU law, although I have to admit that secretly I'm a legal philosopher. I started out in legal philosophy and then increasingly move towards EU law, so sometimes you may uh, catch me in uh, secretly still trying to be a legal philosopher, although I'll focus on EU law mostly these days. Now, a couple of caveats before I start talking about this um, topic, also to link with Anneli. Uh, first of all, I will talk a lot about sovereignty, but this is precisely not because I think that we should look at the EU through the lens of sovereignty alone. Indeed, I think the risk is that we are overemphasizing sovereignty, and part of that reason why we are overemphasizing sovereignty is because we have a very narrow concept of sovereignty. Increasingly, we're being forced to look at a very narrow sovereignty lens to the EU, leading to a very divisive deb debate. So part of what I'm trying to do is actually to redefine sovereignty, to have an evolved concept of sovereignty, allowing a broader debate, which is more inclusive. So don't think that I am overly uh, focusing on sovereignty here alone. Secondly, um, I have to, well, admit that this topic has become slightly more personal over the last couple of months, so I will be using this lecture as well to um, maybe get rid of some personal catharsis about Dutch politics, but you'll understand uh, more of what I'm hinting at in a, in a second, so thank you for being, uh, in that sense, part of my psychotherapy on Dutch politics today. Um, also, note by the way that, um, of course, the topics I'm discussing are hugely controversial. We've been discussing these topics for a couple of thousand years, so I have no illusion that I will completely solve them, settle them, or put them to bed, to stay in my metaphor. Um, and that also means that I very much welcome any interventions. If at some point during my talk you feel like asking a question or commenting, please feel free to do so. It can only make things more lively than just listening to me um, for 30 minutes. So starting point of my debate is basically where I grew up as an EU lawyer. This is what I was taught. Does anyone recognize this picture, by the way? Any idea what it... The black and white will give you a hint that it's not very recent, but uh, anyone care to venture a guess? No? Your hint is here. This is the very first piece of metal that was made under the European coal and steel community. So you see here a couple of very happy, enthusiastic founding fathers of the EU. And this was quite a monumental phase because the very products that were needed to make war were now being made, created under a joint approach. Um, and I use this picture as a kind of starting point for the traditional thinking where we were in a brave new world. Politics, nationalism, sovereignty had led us to destruction. They were morally bankrupt and we were going in a new direction. And often this was either in a federal direction or even one step beyond where we would completely get rid of nationalism and sovereignty and all these old-fashioned concepts, right? Um, now, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of McCormick. Um, and this is part of what I was trained with as well. You know, one of his quotes saying that basically we're going o to overcome sovereignty. A different view would be that sovereignty and sovereign states and the inexorable linkage of law with sovereignty and the state have been but the passing phenomena of a few centuries. Now, of course, every human being wants to believe that we live precisely in that unique moment in history where everything changes, right? You don't want to be part of the boring five centuries that are just summarized in history books as, and then nothing happened for 500 years. No, we are living, luckily, at precisely the moment where everything changes, right? Lucky us, or not. Um, so we would go beyond sovereignty, and the EU was actually part of this process overcoming sovereignty, sovereignty would become obsolete something for history. Now, I'm going to leap ahead a couple of years, so why do we have this? Um, Marine Le Pen, whitewashing her father's party, um, relying heavily, for example, on sovereignty. Uh, the sovereign people have declared they want to take back the reins of their destiny. The sovereign people, who of course speak through her, 
Um, we have similar rhetoric, of course, of other populist politicians. We see in Italy, in Greece, in Hungary, in Poland. Um, this is part of my catharsis I warned you about. This is Thierry Baudet. I'm curious, actually, has he reached Latvian news or not? Hopefully not. He's not that famous, I hope. No. So basically, he's the, the most recent populist in the Netherlands. He um, recently became the largest party in the Dutch Senate. We have a two a bicameral system. Uh, coming basically from uh, virtually nowhere to become the largest party in the Senate. And his entire platform is based on sovereignty and regaining sovereignty for the Dutch people against the EU. Now, why is this personal catharsis? He used to be my roommate in university. We were writing our uh, PhD thesis together. Uh, we were both writing on sovereignty. As you may gather, we had slightly different interpretations of the concept. Um, now, what's the catharsis? At the personal level, I must admit he has been more successful than I am. I think more people know him than know me. Um, so clearly, his concept of sovereignty has been more popular. Um, still, I think I am right. Second part of catharsis um, is that actually he was awarded a PhD by Lyon University, which he now flaunts in political debate, saying, I am not a populist because I have a PhD. Right? So I, I don't think the two exclude each other. Um, but there's been some pressure on Lyon University um, to admit that they were wrong to give him a PhD. And quite frankly, I think we were. Um, um, the title, the, the motto of Lyon University is Presidium Libertatis, so we allow free debate, the free thinking, and yes, there is space for free thinking. We should always accept diverse views, but only if they are sound and based on analytical analysis, which his PhD, I have to say, is not. Um, so this is my personal uh, catharsis, and also why, why the topic of sovereignty has become even more personal for me, because it has become a rallying cry, uh, it become a, a gathering force for populists, and for some reason sovereignty has huge emotional value. Right? Um, I doubt whether most people have the same definition, whether they have any definition, but sovereignty seems to capture something. And of course the big one is this one, take back control, which was a brilliant slogan which is very much based on sovereignty as well. Regaining control of your own destiny, the same message that Marine Le Pen was um, repeating. Again, the second part of my psychotherapy is Boris Johnson. You will see him a couple of times. I'm still trying to get over him, although he may be the next leader of the Conservative Party. Um, so even though the EU was supposed to overcome sovereignty, we actually see, I would say, a revival of sovereignty in, in politics, which gives cause to think, as I, I, I warned you. Um, now, of course, one answer is, Precisely because the EU is overcoming sovereignty, we see a lot of it, right? This is the death throw of sovereignty. This is the final phase where um, angry old white men, to which I'm increasingly belonging, I know, um, are defending the old world precisely because sovereignty is, is being overcome. But I don't think that's the best explanation, and maybe part of it. And I also don't think it's the complete explanation. So basically what I want to do today is to give another part of the uh, possible explanation of what we are actually seeing today and why sovereignty is coming back. So a couple of key hypotheses. First of all, the main one, I don't think the EU did overcome sovereignty. Um, rather, I think it reawakened it. It reopened the very same questions that sovereignty is supposed to answer. Second, um, that's actually a good thing. I think we should have to accept that the purpose of the EU should not be to overcome sovereignty. Again, because the question that sovereignty answers is just a question that will be with us as long as we have politics. Um, rather, I think it should spearhead a further evolution because sovereignty, as I will argue, has evolved a couple of times in history. It's a very fluid concept, so why not evolve further? Now, how then? How should sovereignty evolve? I think it should fit with a narrative where the EU actually becomes a tool to safeguard the power of national peoples, of popular sovereigns to exert that influence. I think most people rightly feel um, and worry that their influence has diminished. Now, I'm not one of the people that likes to make fun of populists because I happen to have a PhD. As I said, you can be both. Um, 
I think even though most people don't, are not familiar with the case law of the Court of Justice and they may not have read the treaty or the withdrawal agreement in great detail, um, you don't need to do that to understand the very basic fact that power is slipping away from member states. In fact, it's something that the EU is proud of. And you also don't need a PhD to understand that we don't have a very good answer yet of how to democratically regulate that. We've been writing about it for more than 60 years. There is not a very convincing answer yet. So the people saying, telling the politicians, so you've been at this European integration for 60 years now, please tell us what's the solution. And our answer is it's a process, right? Um, well, that's not a very convincing answer. So I think we're being rightly challenged. So if you're changing the rule, the governance of a continent, explain, tell us. How will you do it? How will you guarantee democratic influence? Now, this is, of course, strengthened by other factors as well. One of the most shocking studies I saw recently was by a couple of US political scientists who calculated that over 70% of US voters have no influence on policy decisions. Not limited, not marginal, no, zero. Now, I'm not a political scientist. I cannot check their statistics and methodology. Um, but if you read this, it's not very surprising that they don't trust the system, right? No. So, in part, populists have a, have a truth they're working with here. And I think that what we should show them is that the EU is actually part of the answer, part of the solution, not the problem itself. Right? How to deal with these globalizing forces. Now, of course, how do we do that? And here I think I can again link with Anneli. We have to go back to the real forces of, of national power, namely national constitutions, the member states themselves. Now, EU lawyers have a tendency to overestimate, to exaggerate the importance of the EU. If you look at all the traditional power, factors of power, take money, the EU controls 1% of GDP. Member states on average control 50% of GDP. So the money is with the member states. They control the civil servants, they control, and the EU controls via law. It controls via norms. But the hard elements of power and legitimacy are with the member states. That means, I think, if we look at this evolution of sovereignty, we should also look at the member states and their constitutions. Um, and then as a last addition, because indeed the last couple of years I've been equally consumed by Brexit, it's, uh, I mean, if it had been a Netflix series, I would have congratulated the authors on the endless plots, twists, funny characters. It's just um, very interesting to follow, but I want to link it with the Whiteman judgment as well, where I think I might actually have a legal argument to support all of my normative views as well. Okay, so uh, some concepts. Because I use the term sovereignty, and of course, libraries have been written about sovereignty. So I'm just going to use a thin working concept here. The key argument is that um, sovereignty, whatever it is, in any event answers a question that is inherent in political organization, where does ultimate authority lie? Right? The moment that people come together, you organize, you have a potential for conflict, and that means that you have to know who wins when there's a conflict, who decides when we disagree. Um, and this is also, if you look at the first theoretical development of sovereignty yeah, by Baudin in his uh, Six Livres, then you see that actually he was writing about sovereignty in an age where actually there was no sovereignty. The French crown was under extreme pressure. Nobility was challenging the rights of the French crown. So Baudin actually developed his concept of sovereignty as a defense of the French crown. It was how things should be. The French crown should be the ultimate authority. The same with Hobbes, who was also writing in a time of chaos. Sovereignty was there as an organizing principle because we need an organizing principle. Now, for me, that also means that sovereignty, per definition, is not the description of reality. Reality is messy. We have political scientists that tell us that power in reality is divided, it's fluent, it differs per topic, it differs day to day. So precisely because the reality of power is plural, we need a legal abstract concept to create some kind of order. And that will, per definition, always be partially a myth. Right? At the same time, it shouldn't be too far removed from reality for it to have some normative force. So it is a social and a legal construct that orders a chaotic reality by coming up with a kind of an agreed answer. If we disagree, then that person or institution, that rule, 
that piece of paper has ultimate authority. So we postulate a supreme authority that is not actually there as a kind of basis. You know, To avoid this endless regression, we need to base our system on something. Now, that also means that sovereignty is not as God-given or absolute, and that it can change quite a lot, which actually becomes apparent if you um, accept that sovereignty has been held by very different things. I mean, the traditional picture of a sovereign is the king or the queen, mostly kings in those days. Um, but then after the king, after the concept of sovereignty, all kinds of things have been sovereign. So we have sovereign crowns, for example. Some constitutions have a sovereign flag. Well, that's quite a lot of authority for a flag to bear. Um, we have, one of my favorites is the, the Lisbon Urteil from the Bundesverfassungsgericht, where they say at some point that the people are sovereign, then the constitution is sovereign, then the state is sovereign, and at one point it's even the people in the state under the constitution that are sovereign. So it's a kind of holy trinity um, of sovereignty. And we see an increasing development in liberal states, of course, that eventually we settle on the people as the internal sovereign, although at the same time we also accept that the state is the external sovereign. So we've been quite flexible in who we make sovereign. Right? The moment that we make something or someone sovereign, though, a problem arises, um, which is epitomized by our great friend Donald Trump, because the moment you make someone too powerful, what do you do with all the power? There's risk of abuse. So on the one hand, we have a need to create a sovereign power, to create a kind of foundation, a normative basis. The moment we do create a sovereign, we become terrified by that very same sovereign. So what do we do? We happily divide sovereign power. Again, I know I'm skipping over centuries of debate, and I'm taking all kinds of shortcuts, but you can, you can crush me in, at question time then. Um, so we, we start to and. Funnily enough, if we divide sovereign power internally, it's not a problem, right? We take the power of the people, and then we tell the people, okay, this is this kind of mythical moment where you, as a constituent power, create a constitution. Afterwards, you get to say something every four or five years. And then all your sovereign power is delegated to different branches, and we cut it up so that no branch can actually abuse their power. And for some reason, internally, this was fine with sovereignty. So internal sovereignty is as fluid as you can get it. You can divide it, cut it up, create independent bodies like central banks, courts, that cannot be influenced by the people directly. Um, so that's fine. The moment you start transferring sovereignty outside the state, though, it becomes a different story. Because all this sovereignty was contained within this one concept of the state, it becomes more problematic if you start doing it outside the state. Now, this is actually where the sleeping giant metaphor comes in. I would argue that in most European states, and of course um, states with more recent constitutions are exceptions, but in most European states, constitutions had gradually been able to put the <coughs> sovereign giant to sleep. So we created a sovereign, the flag or the people, whatever you wanted. We had manifested all this power in one space, then we had taken all that power away again, and if the system works well, you never need your sovereign. Right? You also see this in the evolution on the theory of sovereignty itself. So in, Bo in Baudin, for example, the French crown was still very much an acting sovereign. So the king had the power to decide certain things. Taxes, although there he was limited by parliament, according to Baudin, but crime, he could appoint people, he could execute laws. So the king was very much an active sovereign. If you then see the evolution in sovereignty theory, if you look at Carl Schmitt, for example, the sovereign has become an exceptional thing. So for Schmitt, the sovereign is actually, per definition, the power that acts in the exception, which means that in normal times, when everything goes well, you don't see the sovereign. The sovereign only comes out when there's problems. So in a well-functioning system, the sovereign is asleep. He shouldn't act, or she shouldn't act in this case. Um, or if we take the more Gulliver Travels slash American, uh, we have tied down the sovereign so it can effectively not really act. And then comes globalization and the EU. 
Now, my argument would be that instead of just being the death throes of sovereignty, the EU also helped reawaken the sovereign in another way because precisely as Amelie also described, the EU deeply intervenes in national constitutional systems. Hmm? And here I also gratefully always uh, look at the work of, of Monica Klaas. National constitutions are confronted with this Europeanization and all of the questions that we thought were settled are reopened. Suddenly we have a court of justice saying, you know, supremacy, that's us. Well, that triggers the very same question that sovereignty was supposed to answer. Namely, who decides in the exception, who decides when there's a conflict? Now, the European Union then claims a kind of sovereignty, but it's also coy about it because the EU is not sovereign. I had to go back to McCormick, he then has this famous comparison that sovereignty is like virginity. Just because the member states lose it doesn't mean that the EU gets it. Well, I don't know whether virginity is like the correct metaphor to think about uh, constitutional issues. Um, but the reality is that the EU only reawakened these questions. So member states now have to re-answer these questions. And now they have to do so in an even more complex setting. It was hard enough to deal with sovereignty within a single member state. We've now upped the ante by having to discuss the same problems in a global level with multiple overlapping regimes that determine decision making. Um, so, yes, it works. Sorry, I'm still a legal philosophy nerd, so this is Smaug from The Hobbit. Um, so we awakened the sovereign dragon, and now what do we do with it? How do we put it back to sleep? Should we put it back to sleep? Um, because, again, otherwise we get this. Hmm? For me, basically, um, I take, a, maybe I'm too uh, critical on, on EU scholars as such, but often uh, the last seven or eight referenda about the EU have been lost. And quite often the response has been, well, the, the opposite party is stupid. Populists don't get it. They don't understand how it works. They're silly. Their arguments are wrong. Their arguments are actually very stupid. My question would then be, why do we keep losing to stupid people? If we're so smart, um, why? Well, because we don't have, I think we have a correct description of the problem, but we don't have a very convincing solution. They have the opposite. <coughs> they have a very convincing solution that is nevertheless wrong, right? Um, and the traditional EU answer has been, let's make the European Parliament more powerful, right? This was the, the reflex for a long time. If we give more power to the European Parliament, then the EU will become more democratic and we will somehow fix the system. Now, for me, this is one of the more painful graphs. Here you see charted against each other, co-decision, or now the ordinary legislative procedure. So you see that the European Parliament increasingly got complete co-decision powers and by now, it's no longer a Mickey Mouse parliament, right? As you know, it has more power than most national parliaments. It is a serious parliament that controls the budget, has veto power over many decisions. At the same time, you see here the turnout of European parliament elections. And the legitimacy curve of the European parliament is not much better. So we have made the European parliament more powerful, and it hasn't helped. People do not feel represented as much by the European parliament as we wanted and it hasn't solved these sovereignty issues. Again, I know I'm skipping over decades of political science research here, and the European Parliament has done quite a few important things and has an important role to play, but it is not the ultimate answer. Which leads me to the assumption that the solution should not be to create European sovereignty. Right? Macron has started to, term this, to, to coin this term. I would not transfer sovereignty to European dimension, uh, but rather, try to find a way where the EU can be more respectful of national sovereignty and more respectful of the national systems we have. Now, um, we see here Kuhn Lehnerts, who once famously said that there is no area left where European law doesn't interfere, that there's no core of, Europe, of national sovereignty left um, in as many phases of federalism peace. Now, in Whiteman, where the court accepted that you have a right to withdraw your notification, so the UK could still remain a member state of the EU. The court starts off in paragraph 44 with its traditional language, right? So we have the founding treaties. They constitute a basic constitutional charter. Um, so the EU is not like ordinary international treaties. The EU is special. And 
Member states have limited their sovereign rights, which of course already asks the question, what concept of sovereignty do you use when you can limit it? In ever wider fields, now remember that the court started out in Van Gente Loos with this statement, but then it, said, it still said in limited fields, and now the sovereignty has been in ever wider fields. Um, so this is the, the, the typical integration approach. But then the court starts to stress national sovereignty. For example, in paragraph 50, the decision to withdraw is for that member state alone to take in accordance with its constitutional requirements and therefore depends solely on its sovereign choice. And then again in paragraph 56, and I think in 57 and in 60 as well, the court says it's a sovereign choice. And this sovereign choice is connected to democracy, the right to self-determination. So it's a sovereign choice to leave the EU and it's a sovereign choice to remain in the EU. Now, don't get me wrong, this is of course a very limited sovereignty. The white man's sovereignty only gives you the power to stay in the EU. Right? That's precisely the kind of sovereignty that populists do not want. But at the same time, I think white man is, I, I think the strongest acceptance I know, the strongest reaffirmation of national sovereignty by the Court of Justice I have ever seen, albeit in the limited context of withdrawal. Now, so let's assume that we want to do something about this. We want to get more national, more respect for national democracy, national sovereignty. The standard answer has now been the national parliaments. This is the second reflex. Also, when I was in the European Commission, whenever they wanted to do something with national democracy, it was national parliaments. So there would be one sentence, we should increase the uh, contribution of national parliaments. And then if you asked how, yeah, we don't really know. Um, now, of course, the focus here has often been to make national parliaments kind of the training wheels. So a little bit of extra national legitimacy, but the European Parliament should remain central, which means that we have introduced the subsidiarity protocol, which Amelie also referred to. National parliaments can actually give a yellow or orange card based on subsidiarity concerns. Note that the orange card was a Dutch invention. It was a brilliant compromise between the red card and the yellow card. Um, and national constitutional courts have, of course, also been very active. Um, think also about the Bundesverfassungsgericht arguing that the German parliament should have a certain power and should keep enough control over European integration. Um, for example, requiring uh, in a vote by the European Parliament if you use Article 352 as a legal basis. At the same time, I wonder whether it's enough to just use national parliaments as, as auxiliary forces. Maybe they should come more in with more force. Now, we reach exactly the problem that um, national constitutional authors also say. Well, national constitutions were not designed with the EU in mind. Hmm? Some of them were drafted in the EU era, but many of them were not, which means that many of these systems have not been designed with new sovereignty in mind. They have been designed, even if they were drafted in the EU age, on constitutional theory that assumed an autarkic national state, where democracy was influencing how the state acted. Democracy should become, part of democracy should become, to determine how your state acts in international fora. Um, because many national actors have received new roles, if you become head of state, suddenly you find yourself in the European Council. Congratulations. Um, quite often you didn't really campaign on the European Council. In the Netherlands, at least, if you want to become prime minister, the last thing you do is to talk about the EU. So you don't talk about the EU, you become prime minister, and you find yourself at the heart of European power. Um, which means, I think, that these systems need to be recalibrated. So instead of just looking at the European Constitution, I would also argue that we need to strongly rethink our national constitutional systems and to refit them um, in a way that makes them more suitable for life in a globalized reality. Now, of course, how do you do that? And as a true academic, this is where I have least to offer because it comes to actual solutions instead of describing the problem. So I fit perfectly within my own profession. Um, my, my limited attempt so far um, would come up with a kind of confederal sovereignty. 
The logic was that we would have a European Federation. Now, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So why not go to the Confederate stage? Which means that the logic is that we have the people that delegate authority to their state and to the European Union. So the European Union has delegated sovereign authority. And if you take the concept of internal popular sovereignty, that's not a problem. People can delegate their sovereignty to whomever they want. The problem is that we then need to readjust our constitutional system to make this work democratically. Now, some ideas. And again, these are rough. First of all, you can only do this in a way that fits with every national system. So you cannot have a one-size-fits-all constitutional solution to say if you just do this, if you insert this paragraph in your constitution, we're there. You need to work from the logic of each individual constitution. Secondly, I think you need to create at least an institutional nexus. Again, that's not very surprising. I'm an institutional scholar, so I think in institutions. Um, but my argument would be that you create at least a national political arena to fight about EU issues. Because the problem you see in many member states is that national politics is about national politics, and then people complain that national politicians don't talk about the EU. Well, if you reward national politicians for fighting national politics, you cannot criticize them for not talking about the EU. So what do you do? You create an arena where they have to talk about the EU and where they can gain power. If you want to attract politicians, you need to give them power in return. So they need to be able to accumulate power through talking about the EU, by having an EU agenda. So that means that your EU agenda should become important, relevant, to take the important decisions. Where does politics play when you talk about money, where you control expenditure, control legislation? Um, and you need to have elections to win. You need to have an arena to fight in. Now, Similarly, control of that arena must be important for national power. So you need to have European arenas, you need to fight about European issues, and you need to win those fights to have national political power, because national political power is still the primary price. If you ask people, what do you want to be, Chancellor of Germany or President of the European Council, trust me, they will choose Chancellor of Germany if they have the choice. It's maybe nice to become the President afterwards of the European Council, um, Maybe it won't always make you very popular in your home state, but it's at least interesting. So primary power is still national, so you need to connect EU power to that national power. Um, now, tentative example to operationalize this, European Senates. Again, I know I run into all kinds of difficulties. I will acknowledge them in a second. But just as a thought experiment, um, we have 16 member states if my accounting is correct, that have a second room. And many of those states are wondering what to do with their second chamber. Right? The House of Lords has been on the list to be uh, removed for a while now, but the Lords are tenacious. We have our second room in, in the Netherlands as well, and there's an active debate about getting rid of it. Why do we need two chambers of parliament? Well, maybe it's simplistic, but if more than half of your legislation is dependent on the EU, why not have a European chamber? Instead of having a European Senate, why not have a European chamber at the national level? And that European chamber would be elected via direct elections on EU issues, and that European chamber would have a direct say over the budget, making it relevant for national law. So that you reflect the serious impact of European integration in your national constitutional system. Now, will this happen? Um, when pigs fly, I think, is the British. Um, there's all kinds of obstacles. Why? Current political and constitutional systems are often equilibrium. Changing the rules of the game always has political losers. Changing constitutions usually requires a supermajority. So uh, changing changes of this scale are probably going to upset the political balance, so it will be blocked by someone. Right? Um, it may not be feasible in all systems. Current elites would therefore probably also um, deadlock it. Maybe we are focusing on the wrong problem. The EU is maybe only a symptom but not the problem itself, which is globalization as such, changing nature of economics, of politics. 
um, maybe we need to go to a completely non-state based concept of legitimacy and democracy. Maybe I'm still trapped in my 20th century statist thinking um, uh, and we need a kind of Elon Musk or someone who's maybe less volatile to come up with a brilliant new idea that fits. But within our constitutional current landscape, um, I still think that this can at least be a way to think more constructively <coughs> and instead of just saying the EU is bad, to simply ask the question, so how can we translate our national constitutional systems into systems that are more appropriate for their function. So let me just leave it at that with another picture of Boris. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. And uh, my question will be like more private about uh, Holland, Netherlands. Uh, do you think that uh, this movement is growing up? Um, because like uh, also each voting time, the party of uh, Gerd Wilder get more and more votes in the parliament. And in 2017, uh, it was also discussing uh, will the Rutte still uh, stay as a prime minister, or uh, Gert Wilder will be a new prime minister? Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. And I suppose you are voting for uh, Rutte. Uh, no, actually, I'm not voting for Rutte. Uh, uh, also not for Thierry, as you may have gathered uh, from our presentation. But um, thanks for your question and your grasp of, of Dutch politics. Now, I'm aware of the risk. For, um, for a man with a hammer, everything is a nail. I come from everything as an EU scholar, so I, I think that the EU is very relevant to everything. It may be true that the EU is actually not the real issue, but other issues. Um, economic insecurity, uh, migration are, are the real issues that people are worried about. And we do see that the share of voters going to populism and extreme right is growing. So one of the worrying things is that many of the voters for Thierry Baudet did not come from Wilders, but come from other parties. Um, so. It does seem that the growth of Wilders is stopping, so he's no longer winning. Relatively speaking, he's losing. So in the new Senate elections, he lost compared to his earlier output. But he's not losing as much as uh, uh, Baudet is winning. So overall, the extreme right is winning in the Netherlands, as you see in many member states. And parties are, Dutch parties are as desperate as parties in other member states. Uh, how to deal with this? So far, Rutte has been, they call him the Teflon man as well. Uh, nothing sticks to him. He's been prime minister for nine years now. He's managed to, to stay in power for a long time by having, well, relatively little vision and, and changing coalitions. Um, but there is, as, at least in my perception, the <coughs> Netherlands doesn't have any systemic strong answer either. Um, so far, it's just as in many other member states. Let's hope that the center holds and that the right grows, but not enough to take over actual power, um, which is not very reassuring. Any other questions? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chris Epstamos. I'm from the Constitutional Court of Republic of Latvia. Uh, a few weeks ago, just in this very room, we had uh, Professor Joseph Weiler uh, here, and he identified the problem that you are uh, describing as the problem with EU uh, as actually a problem with funda fundamental rights. So he was um, describing this last backlash against EU international law as backlash against individual rights, uh, as too much protection given to uh, minorities and majorities objecting towards that. And I think that sort of explains the skepticism to EU. And your solution of giving we the people the power to delegate their sovereignty to EU sounds good in theory and it might ac accommodate <coughs> Weiler's criticism as well. But uh, your solutions appear to be designed as institutional solutions. So it is going to be the governments who are going to be delegating more sovereignty to EU or delegating it differently, not we the people. And I think there is no way of meaningfully 
making people delegate their sovereignty to the EU because the EU is evil, which protects fundamental rights of the minorities. So aren't we in a deadlock already yeah. at the starting point? Yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's a kind of a, um, a circle, right? You, if you want to legitimately delegate power to the EU, people first need to like the EU. For people to like the EU, it needs to be democratic, so it needs to have been delegated power legitimately. How do you get out of this deadlock? Now, first of all, we are in a very difficult situation, I would say. Um, we've had 50 years of relatively strong EU support, and we did not use those years to get this properly fixed. So now we have to fix it. We have to fix the roof while it's raining very, very hard. So it's not going to be easy. Um, what I would argue is that, well, this is basically the job you have to do. So is it going to be easy? No. But you, um, I fully agree with you. I, I overemphasize the institutions here. I'm an institutional scholar, so that's my, my, my knee-jerk reaction to go to the institutions. Institutions don't solve everything. They need to be based on substance as well. And that needs, means that the second part is that we need a much more convincing, substantive narrative. Indeed, the EU should not be the story of international elites that only protect um, elite minorities and global economic uh, minorities uh, against the ordinary working people that are robbed of their power. That's the narrative that we should escape. So a second part of my research is actually working together with social scientists, with social psychologists and neuroscientists, studying what type of positive narrative, of positive emotional narrative fits within EU law. So I'm also working on the substantive part, which is way out of my comfort zone, um, but it's, it's very interesting. But I fully agree that in order to convince the people to delegate this type of power, you need a very convincing substantive narrative as well. It's not, not enough to say, I mean, I, I, I understand that I'm one of the very few people that gets enthusiastic based from institutions and constitutions. I'm not going to win elections with those types of arguments. No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, extremely interesting presentation, and maybe I'll ask a, a few questions later on more specifically. But on a more general level, one um, issue that um, emerged through my project is that the constitutions, you mentioned the, the we the people and the popular sovereignty. Uh, but one uh, uh, development that emerged to me is that constitutions often actually very specifically um, require that people or the, the individuals, the citizens, must have a real and genuine way to participate in public affairs, to influence the shaping of their living conditions, and that there must be, the government must make sure that there are real and genuine opportunities for the citizens to participate in policy making, especially the Spanish constitution, the Finnish constitution, Slovenian and uh, Slovak constitutions, and others have these points. And what, uh, I think hasn't received um, uh, attention at the EU level is that the European Parliament operates um, in, mainly in, in a few uh, selected languages and most um, people in the, in the member state uh, find it maybe difficult on a practical level to communicate the, the issues and concerns that they have to the European Parliament in, in English, French or in, in, um, in German. Um, and there are also issues around um, the, the cost and the distance. I was thinking there was a, a protest by Estonian farmers about how they find it difficult to um, deal with EU sanctions which are costly and, and that the rules are difficult to understand so they, they can't plan their behaviour. And they, 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 they look tired and they uh, protested in front of the Estonian parliament, Rigigogu, but I was just trying to picture how they would go actually physically to Brussels, uh, which is costly for an average Estonian where the salaries are low, and also how they would put this point articulately through in English or, or French to European politicians. Uh, and another practical example is uh, there was a... A, a point about genetically modified foods uh, that received media attention one day before the expected vote in Brussels um, when the Green Party or the Green Movement uh, brought this to the media. So Estonia is, for example, trying to become an eco-state, um, a, a naturally uh, produce, uh, where food would be naturally produced. Um, and most of the people subscribe to this idea. But the Estonian government was going to vote for allowing genetically modified foods to Estonia. 
And the discussion only emerged a day before the vote in Brussels, when it was too difficult to mobilize any sort of change. Or, uh, so, so there are a lot of practical um, occasions which are really direct practical importance to people and when they feel that perhaps they can't influence the decision making because of practical and structural uh, reasons yeah. and maybe that that needs addressing in the EU structures. Thank you. No, I am um, well, on, the, on the issue of having enough vote and influence I very much like the work of Joanna uh, Mendes in Luxembourg also where she analyzes in great detail and with a lot of nuance how you can get your point across and influence the EU decision-making process. But I would also say that the national system is not effective enough in translating the national voice into EU policy. And that's clearly a problem. I mean, I did, I spent some time in the Dutch parliament explaining some things to, to European, of the Dutch parliamentarians. Um, many of them would get fiches of EU legislation six weeks before the legislation is voted on in council. Completely past the point that you can do anything. Um, most of them didn't even read them. My most disingenuous moment was when one member of parliament said, I don't think I understand what you're saying about the EU, but even if I would understand, I would still disagree with you. Which was, I think, the ultimate discussion stopper. Um, so if even members of parliament are that late in the debate, then clearly people influencing their members of parliament have no influence either. So this is why I would change the national system. And of course, many member states have developed better system. The Nordic system seems to be working a bit better in, in, in um, controlling votes in council, etc. But you need to develop the entire system before parliament influences the minister in a democratic way as well for it to work. Now, the hope has been that people would go to Brussels directly for the European Parliament, and that's not working. And for many of the reasons you mentioned, I think it's going to be difficult to make that work. Language costs knowledge. I mean, I have 1,250 new first-year students every year. When I give them a lecture, I ask, how many members of the European Parliament do you know? 1,250 collectively, we maybe get to three or four. And that's the, the intellectual elite in being. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that's, I think, uh, my general problem, which for me would only emphasize the need to get our act together at the national level better.